let's get started. The Holy Spirit, who is he? Now, uh, I want to make sure that I review, because I was noticing when I was going back through my notes, I was giving a lot of information. And one of the things, I used to be a um, high school teacher, and we used to get this thing, Joffrey. Now that was my that was my roommate in college, Joffrey. Man, so thank you so so thank you so much for joining, man. Uh, over the summer, I stayed with him over the summer. Powerful, powerful, powerful man right there. Okay, but anyway, uh, one of the things I want you to understand is that when I used to teach high school, they I used to get evaluated on a system called a PEPI, and what they would say is a good teacher always open with the open with they open with they review and they close with the review. So I want to make sure that I give you guys a review of where we're going so far. Sometimes I can get out there and I can give a whole lot of information and I and I get out there I, because I want to make sure that you get it. Because if you don't get this step, moving into things of God sometimes is like algebra or geometry, okay? What I mean by that is that you don't have a strong foundation here. It's hard to understand things here. Then it's hard to understand things here. So it's very important that you understand things on a very base level and then you can begin to move into the things of God. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And today I titled this, Who is the Holy Spirit? And I want to make sure that we understand who he is. Who he is. And then we're going to talk about his purpose on, on Thursday. But who is the Holy Spirit? If you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, I'm not going to read this scripture because it's kind of long, but Acts chapter 5 A-C-T-S, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, a lot of times you'll hear a lot of different people say Holy Ghost, and then you'll hear people say Holy Spirit. And a lot of times, I know I came from a very traditional background, and we thought that if you said Holy Ghost, that means you were more spiritual, you were more uh, 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 deeper than people that said Holy Spirit. It's no difference. Holy Ghost is just Old English for spirit. That's all that is. It's nothing, it's nothing deep about Holy Ghost or anything like that. Holy Ghost is just Old English for spirit. So when I say Holy Ghost, sometimes when I'm teaching, I'll teach and I'll say Holy Ghost, and then sometimes I'll say Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the same thing. I'm not talking about anything different. I'm talking about the same thing. Holy Ghost is just Old English for spirit. And sometimes in the Bible, you'll see different translations. You'll see Holy Ghost. And then you'll see Holy Spirit. There's really no difference. It's the same thing. So who is the Holy Spirit? Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, scriptures here in the Bible. And it was a man and his wife named Ananias and Sapphira. And at this particular time, they were given a charge to sell their land. And what they were supposed to bring the profits that they made from that land and lay it at the apostles' feet. They were supposed to, thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Harris. They were supposed to bring all of the profits that they made and lay it at the apostles' feet. Well, when they came in, the first one came in, I think it was, uh, and I think it was Sapphire, I think the woman came in first. I don't, I'm not sure, you have to read the text. It's the woman or the man came in first. And when she stood before the apostles, he said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Because she kept back some of the money. She lied and said she sold it for this month because she had kept back some of the money. And her and her husband had conspired to lie. And so they came up with this conspiracy to lie. And then they went in there and they lied to the apostle of God. And when he was standing before the apostle, he said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And immediately when he said that, she dropped dead and she fell. Then the husband came in, or I think the wife came in second, and he act, she was given the same opportunity. She could have come clean, could have told the truth, could have said exactly what had happened, what they had sold the money for. But this time, what the apostles said was, they said, why? They said, you didn't lie to the Holy Ghost. They said, you lied to God. And he dropped dead or she dropped dead, and she fell dead as well. So the first point I want you to get is who is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is God. I want you to get that. The Holy Spirit is God. So if the Holy Spirit is God, he has the same characteristics 
and the same nature as God. What do you mean by that, Bishop? If the Holy Spirit is God, there are three things, three distinct characteristics of God. Number one, he's omnipotent. Number two, he's omnipresent. And number three, God is omniscient. God is omnipotent, God is omnipresent, and God is omniscient. Those are three things. So what are these things? Omnipotent means all-powerful. Omnipresence means he's everywhere at the same time. Omniscient means he's all-knowing. Scripture reference for this omnipotent is Ephesians 3.20, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, said God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think, listen at this, according to the power that's working in you. He's talking about the Holy Ghost right there. The power of the Holy Spirit is able to do. That's why it's amazing to me how we as Christians, we are, we are limited in our thinking. Because we should never be limited in our thinking. Because the Spirit of God that's on the inside of you as a believer that came to rest on the inside of you, he made it able that you, he could do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. Wow, that's all powerful. The next characteristics that make the Holy Spirit God, if the, if, if the Holy Spirit is God, is that he's omnipresent. You find this reference in Psalms 139, verses 7 and 8. Psalms 139, verses 7 and 8. Psalms 139, verses 7 and 8. And the, the psalmist opened up by saying, where can I hide from your spirit? That's what he opened up and he said. He said, where can I hide from your spirit? He said, if I ascend to the uttermost parts of the earth, he said, you're there. He said, if I make my bed in hell, he said, you're there. So I don't ever want you to start saying as a believer, because now you have the spirit of God on the inside of you. Never say that you are alone. Never say you can't make it. Never say I'm, I'm forsaken. Never say, never say that I'm abandoned. Never say that you're an orphan. You are not an orphan because the Holy Spirit, you have the presence of of God on the inside of you. The third characteristic is he's omniscient. Now the word omniscient, you won't find that in the Bible, but the word omniscient simply means all-knowing. He's all-knowing. So you can't ever get in a situation and you say, I don't know what to do because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what to do. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine says this, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, Neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God has in store for his people. But listen, he said, but the spirit of God knows those things. So the spirit of God is all knowing. He's all knowing. So uh, the first thing I want you to understand, I want you to get is that the Holy Spirit is God. And if the Holy Spirit is God, he shares the same characteristics and the same nature as God. That means he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and he's omniscient. So you have access to that power, which brings me to number two, where does the Holy Spirit live? The Holy Spirit lives in you. When you gave your heart to Christ, and I walk you through that prayer in lesson number one, I think lesson one or lesson two, when I walk you through that prayer, and if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, if you repented, if you believed, if you called on Jesus and you confessed Jesus as Lord of your life, now I'm not talking about you start doing a whole bunch of abstinence and say, okay, I'm going to get it all together and I'm just going to start going to church. I'm going to start trying to live right. That's the, that, that, that doesn't make you saved. <sighs> I'm going to talk about on uh, Thursday, water baptism does not make you saved. And I don't care what Reverend said, Reverend is wrong. I don't care what your doctrine says, your doctrine is wrong. I don't care what your religion says, your religion is wrong. Getting it all together, so you're going to be baptized, that does not make you saved. What makes you saved when the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you is that you've repented, this, repentance is just a big old religious word that simply means you decide to change your mind. You said that I'm not doing this the right way. I'm not doing this the right way. And so you changed your mind. You changed your mind. And not only did you repent, you believed. 
there's nothing that you can do in your own power to make you right. That's what I was talking about, abstinence and, and, and trying to do everything right. Start trying to go to church and start trying to stop lying and start trying to uh, pay your taxes and start trying to stop doing all these different things. Start trying to stop having sex outside of marriage and I'm going to stop smoking weed. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing that. All those things, good afternoon, Mrs. Bradford. All those things are just abstinence. It has nothing to do with being born again. Being born again has nothing to do with that. So you have to believe in a power that's greater than you. You have to believe in God, Jesus' death. I mean, you have to believe in Jesus' birth, Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' burial, his resurrection. You have to believe on a power that's greater than you because there's nothing you can do to make it right. So you have to believe on a power that's greater than you. And then number three, you have to call on Jesus. The Bible says those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you have to call on him. And when you call on Jesus, he will come and reside on the inside of you. And then the fourth thing you have to do is confess him as Lord of your life. If you did those four things, you've been born again. That's what we call the born again experience. At that moment, the Holy Spirit comes and live on the inside of you. You're no longer the same person. You may feel like you're the same, but you're not. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. I just get chill bumps every time I think about it because everything that you've done in your past, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you didn't do, how you didn't get it right, what regrettable thing that you're living with, what guilt thing that you're living with, it doesn't even matter anymore. Because once you do those four things, God takes up residence on the inside of you. And you are a new creature. So the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of the believer. And that's when he, and you have this force, this power, that's on the inside of you, this power, this world-changing, earth-shaking power, this demon-fearing power on the inside of you. That's why you can say you're no longer hopeless. That's why you can say you're no longer, I don't know an answer, because there is an answer. That's why you can never say I'm hopeless, and you give up, and you throw your hands up in the air, and you start walking away. You can never say that again. You can never say I don't have a destiny anymore, because when the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you, your destiny becomes into fruition. So the Holy Spirit is God. He lives on the inside of you. Point number three, and I want you to get this, is that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. That does not mean that God is Jesus, Jesus is God, God is the Holy Spirit and all those different things. It doesn't mean that. It's three distinct things. It's a Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But they function as one. You can't have them separate. They function as one. The best way I can explain this is that if you look at an egg, okay, you look at an egg. What three things that makes up an egg? Well, it has a yolk, it has the fluid on the outside of the egg, and then it has the shell. Those three things have to be in place in order to have an egg. It's the same thing with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three of those are one. Next thing I, I will uh, analogize it to is water. Three things make water water. It could be a solid, it could be a liquid, it could be a, it could be a gas. It could be three things, but all three are one. They are one in purpose. They are one in their goals. They are one in their aims. They are one in their ambitions. It's the same way that you are made. That's why when he spoke out and he said, in the book of Genesis, he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. There are three things that make you, you. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a physical thing called a body. You represent Christ and you represent the Godhead in the earth. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in an earthly body. I was remembering, I'm going to take a little 
bunny trail here. I was talking to, uh, uh, while I'm doing that, I want you to get 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and read that, and then I'll go into my uh, analogy because, see, the Bible says we are supposed to contend for the faith. And a lot of Christians are afraid to say what they believe, and the reason they're afraid to say what they believe is because they don't know what they believe. Okay, and I was talking to First Corinthians. Thank you for putting that up, Miss Bradford. I really appreciate that. First John chapter five, verse seven, and 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 one of the things I was talking to um, a, a Muslim guy, and a Muslim guy was saying, "Well, y'all believe in three different gods and all these different things." Well, first of all, we don't believe in three different gods. There's only one God manifested in three different ways. He manifests himself in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? But what's amazing to me is that a lot of American Muslims, now I'm not talking about a lot of American Muslims. See, I have a, I have a friend of mine who's a Muslim. Um, she's from Iraq, and uh, I'm, 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 I've came this close to converting her. I've come so close to converting her. But a lot of American Muslims, they're Muslims, but they don't really know what they believe, okay? They believe that they, ha they have three different gods as well. They believe in Allah, but they, they believe that Allah, like G they believe that Allah also had a messenger in the earth. That's why a lot of American black Muslims followed Elijah Muhammad, because they thought that Elijah Muhammad was Jesus in the earth. They don't know that. But a lot of their ideas, they get it from Christianity. They get it from Christianity. And so they try to make it seem like Christians are backwards when actuality, when you start looking at it, there's no more sound faith than that of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you have to study the word. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. And that's my time, but we're going to stick with this a little bit longer. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. Now look at this. It says... There are three, I'm trying to read this, okay. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, we know the Word is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. They're one. So God planned redemption. You see that in John 3, 16, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God planned redemption. Jesus lived the redemptive plan in the earth. Jesus lived the redemptive plan. And then the, what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to teach you the things of Jesus. It's to teach you the word of God. It's to teach you the knowledge of Christ. It's to give you the gifts so you can walk in the gifts of the Spirit. A lot of people don't know that we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. A lot of people talk about the gifts of the Spirit, but God gave gifts to the church. Jesus gave gifts to the church, and the Holy Spirit gave gifts to the church. God gave, I mean, Jesus gave five gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. God gave seven gifts to the church, gifts of administration, gifts of healing, gifts of all these different things, gifts of exhortation. And then there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. All three have, all three are separate, but they function as one. You got to get that. The fourth thing, and we'll close with this one, is that the Holy Spirit is a real person. Okay? Number one, I told you that the Holy Spirit is God. And then if he's God, he's manifesting himself. He has the same character and nature is God, which means he's omnipotent, omnipresent, he's omniscient. The second thing I told you was is that God, the Holy Spirit, lives on the inside of you. When you went through the prayer of repentance, asked God to come into your heart, that's what came to reside on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit. The third thing I told you is that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. He's a third person. Doesn't mean all three are one, but they are one in their aims. They're one in their goals. They're one in their ambitions. They're one in their objectives concerning humanity. 
They're never not separate. They are one in that. But they're three different characteristics. They're three different natures. And then the fourth thing I want you to understand is that the Holy Spirit is a real person. The Holy Spirit is not an influence. The Jehovah Witnesses, I think they teach that the Holy Spirit is an influence. He's not an influence. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. You know, I come from the Pentecostal church, and the first thing they said, ooh, it hit me, baby. Ooh, ooh, it hit me. No, it didn't. It didn't hit you. It didn't. It, it didn't. It didn't hit you. It didn't. That's your reaction to his power. But it it didn't. He don't, he, he's not up there. The Holy, uh, it's amazing. The Holy Spirit not up there just hitting people. He's not doing that. He's not, it, it, it didn't hit you. The Holy Spirit is not yelling and bucking. It's not that. Is your reaction to it? Is your reaction to it? It's not. That's not the Holy Spirit yelling and bucking and jumping. Those appear, and that, that 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 throws a lot of sinners for a loop because a lot of sinners are sitting there thinking now if I got to yell and buck and scream and holler and tear people churches and and do all those kinds of things if I got to do that I don't want the Holy Ghost I don't want that. I want that. I gotta act like I'm out of control when the Bible tells you that God does things in decency and in order. A lot of that is not the Holy Ghost that you see going on in church. A lot of that is just people. They 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 they're just out of they're just out of control. It's just people. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost don't turn people off. The Holy Ghost is attractive. The Holy Spirit is not power. It's not power. He manifests in power, but it's not power. That's what you get when you get the Holy Spirit on the inside. It's like a benefit. It's like when you go swimming, okay? Wet comes with the water. That's what power comes. You get power, but he's not power. He's a person. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is not gifts. He has gifts, but it's not gifts. The Holy Spirit is not fruit. He has fruit, but it's not fruit. What people are talking about a lot of times is they're talking about manifestations of the Holy Spirit. When you see people speaking in tongues, that's, it. that's the Holy Ghost right there. No, that's a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is a real person. And I want you to get that because if he's a real person, that means that communion is possible. And I'm telling you, once you get to this place where you can commune with the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you guys, I got some very disturbing news on the phone last night from a friend of mine that called me. And I was so kind of perplexed by it. And I'm taking a little bunch of, I'm going to close here. Because I don't think people know the person of the Holy Spirit. I don't think they know the person of the Holy Spirit. I think they think it's a it, it's a feeling, it's tongues, it's all this other stuff. I don't think they know him as a person. Because see, when you know him as a person, that means you can commune with him. You can talk to him. You can ask him for advice. He will show you, he will teach you things. I'm going to pick up right here on Thursday because I want you to get this. But I was talking to a friend of mine and he told me some very disturbing news. And I was really like, oh man. But the thing is, and I kept asking myself like, Lord, what is going on? And the thing that's going on is that people don't know how to commune with the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit He'll teach you how to be a husband. The Holy Spirit will teach you how to be a wife. I got a lot of coaches, football coaches, that I mentor that look to me as their spiritual leader. They're not connected to a church. They don't want to go to a church, don't like the church, but they look to me as their pastor. They, they, they ain't concerned about no church. They not going. I'm telling you, they're not going. The church has lost out with them. They've been hurt and been destroyed by the church. But they saw something in my life, and they've connected to me. And I, I tell them all the time, I said, man, listen, the Holy Spirit will teach you how to call plays. He will. 
He'll teach you how to call plays. He'll teach you how to make investments. You don't have to file bankruptcy. He'll teach you how to come out of debt. He'll teach you how to raise a child. He'll teach you how to be a good employee, employer. He'll teach you how to build a business. He taught me and my wife. I, he, he'll teach you how to get a PhD. He taught me. I, listen, listen, listen. I was not the, 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 the star student. Guys, I flunked out of college, flunked out. I didn't get put out. I flunked out. They told me, you can't come back. Don't come back. But I began to commune with the Holy Spirit, and he showed me how to write papers. He showed me how to do plans. He showed me how to study. He showed me how to prepare. See, guys, we got to get rid of this. It's a it. It's a feeling. It's it. Oh, 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 oh. That's the Holy Ghost. Oh, 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 oh. That's not the Holy Spirit. It's not. It's your reaction to the Holy Spirit. It's your reaction. So I want to tell my friends, and you know, I know you see a lot of things that are confusing you in the body of Christ, but don't get confused with that. You need this power. You need this power because everything that you've done, you've done it and it hadn't been working. You've been, you've been praying and it hadn't been working. You've been believing and it hadn't been working. You've been trying to do all types of good stuff and it hadn't been working. You've tried to do everything in your own power and it's becoming worse. And you need something to help you. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Spirit. You need him. You need him. You need him. He'll teach you. He is a real person. He lives on the inside of you. You have this power that you need to tap into. And he'll show you things that don't.